Good morning. Welcome to Viewpoint, your program of personalities, politicians, and perspectives. Boy, we got perspectives for you today. Uh, we always try to start out at Viewpoint with a kudo. Boy, we got kudos running out the barn door this morning. Uh, first and foremost, uh, and this is serious, I don't want to be too tried about this at all. Uh, a very serious appreciation for Lincoln Lodge number 210, uh, Masonic Order. Uh, the old fellow got to be uh, good old as time went by. And they decided they'd had him around for 75 years, and they'd recognize that. So they had a very nice uh, reception for Bill, uh, the Masonic Temple last Sunday, which I appreciated very much, and I wish to express my appreciation for that. And secondly, and of a lighter note, there's a lady in town who's really earned her spurs for a breakfast or maybe a drink at Old Joe's. I don't know what she does. But in any event, old fellow went into a, a store the other day, a large parking lot, huge parking lot and he went in the east door and came out the west door <laughs> and he couldn't find his car <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing there scratching my very ear trying to figure out oh it wasn't me it was somebody else anyway uh, uh, <laughs> when he saw what my dilemma was <laughs> and got lover she un unhooked her car and un got out of it and said, are you lost, sir? And I said, no, I, my car's lost. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, a kind, uh, a kind note of appreciation to a strange lady who uh, did a good, good deed for an old man. She found my car for me. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, to an anonymous lady. Uh, thank you very much. That was very nice of you. And Judith K, you've got a couple things you want to. Yes, I've had. Now wait a minute. You're uh, wait a minute. You're I put you on the clock. Oh yeah. <laughs> I I have had that same thing happen to me a couple times. And God love the people in the Lincoln area. They they spot an old person and they they try to be nice to them and act like well everybody loses their car. It's just <laughs> it's a very common thing. They, so they don't embarrass you at all. So well, bless was, the hearts of nice people. I was standing out there in our parking lot, kind of not being very nice to myself, uh, old fool and all that. And about that time, this lady solved my problem and solved it. Bless her heart. So God love her. Now, let's get down to some serious I got to say about what I did on Sunday. Well, now, wait a minute. I have to talk to Mr. Ash to see if we got you <laughs> on the clock yet. Okay, go right ahead. I went to the Christian church for their tea, and it was the nicest thing, really lovely a lot of people did a lot of work to bring that off and you ladies and dressed up to the nines that was your harvest of talent recognition wasn't it yes it was and it was it was a wonderful thing oh that's nice jim mm -hmm. is getting a microphone for our guest as long as he drove all the way over here we might as well let him so talk cross denominational lines on sunday yes i did i did how brave of you well yeah. i'll tell you what that was a lovely <laughs> afternoon and i thank them um, and we have a very good guest. Haven't seen him for a little while. I don't know if you're laying low. He's the he's economic. Been a chubbies. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he's he's the economic director for uh, economic development. Yes. And that's kind of tough. It is in tough. this day and age it and is in this tough. part of the world. But Logan County's blessed to have several folks working on economic development, not just myself. I mainly am out in the county in the smaller communities. We've got a new person, you know, here in Lincoln that the private group of businessmen hired, and I'm terrible, I'm not going to remember her name. And then the city just hired Beth. Cavalman Davis oh. to do s specific work for the city itself. Uh huh. So, well, I'll tell you, uh, we need some help. Now we have an. Are you speaking personally or generally? <laughs> All of the okay. above, especially today. Um, where was I? I don't know, but I actually came prepared to talk about lots of other things besides economic <laughs> development, but I'm, I'm happy to do that if you want, whatever Tell you want. Tell us th this new marijuana plant, what does it do for this area? 
Well, the besides plant give you marijuana. Yeah, the the plant started out as a sm relatively small facility simply to grow marijuana for medicinal use purposes only because that's what the state law was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at and that I remember time. that was my first year on the job about five years ago or so, and there were when you drove by there were only a few less than five six cars out there. Have you driven by lately? Oh, oh, this oh morning every Wednesday yeah. morning. Yeah, that's what it does yeah. for us. Yeah. Regardless of your opinion one way or the other on the product being made, it is legal now. Economically, it's a yeah. big deal. And and that it payroll is a big payroll. A lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, uh -huh. so so I must remember to look at it in that light. Yes. Yeah, because I'm otherwise I'm kind of cool to the whole sure. proposition. Sure. But well, I have a TL. I have a TL for the fir firm down the street here. Uh, my son was involved in that field, uh, and uh, he running a, a medicinal store uh -huh. for a, a, an entrepreneur up in Canton. Mm. And so, uh, as a consequence, this Cresco down the street here sells to r retailers like Greg was running over. Yep. And Greg said they they grow good stuff, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know a quality product is coming out of the county. If you're going to grow it, you might as well grow yes. the good stuff, I yes. guess. Yes. Uh, it is interesting to see once the legislature made that possible, how that uh, industry has grown. Now, I can uh, share with you there's going to be another large opportunity for jobs coming to the county oh, over, in, over in Mount Pulaski. Good. You remember the... Uh, I think it's 40,000 some square foot plus stalls furniture building there yeah. on the oh, west yeah. side of oh, Pulaski. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after many, many, many years being a successful furniture store, it uh, closed and the property has been up for sale for a couple of years. Yeah. And that's a hard sell to oh, yeah. find a, a new use for a 40,000 plus square foot building. Well, there's a firm called Quick Walls, K-W-I-K dash W-A-L-L-S, Quick Walls, out of Springfield, Illinois, yeah. and they manufacture uh, office dividers, you know, to create office oh, yes. workspaces. Okay, partitions. And, yes, partitions. Yeah. Thank uh -huh. you, Bill. That's the word I wanted. Yeah. And all sorts of other things related to movable, expandable, <coughs> extendable walls. Well, they've run out of space because their business is going so well in Springfield, they need to expand, and they're purchasing the Stalls building. Hallelujah. That will bring about 20-plus uh, manufacturing jobs, three or four administrative jobs, and in a further plus for Pulaski, our office has also been very uh, closely helping a group of local farmers over there put together a new food co-op. Uh -huh. oh. And what it will be is a place where folks in this county, more and more of them are, and in the surrounding area, are growing fresh vegetables. Yes. Okay, like Dave Bishop, south of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But one of the challenges is, where do you process that food? Mm -hmm. It's too expensive to do it on your own how farm. How do you get it to market? Yes, and how do you get it to market? And how do you find your customer? That's a lot to put on a farmer in addition to just doing the agricultural work of producing the product. So they banded together, formed a co-op, and now this all reverts back to the stalls building. The quick walls people are going to rent them several thousand feet that they still have available in the building to create their production facility. Oh, so it's just a, a it, it's a great win-win situation. The other thing, lots is happening in Mount Pulaski. Uh, the other thing that's happening is, you know, they expanded their hardware store. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. They moved out of the old building just south of the square into what had been the grocery store in the north end of town, remodeled it, expanded it. Well, then there's this old hardware store building. What do you do with that? It's not 100% official yet, so I can't tell you the names, but there's a firm here in Lincoln that is also going to expand and buy oh, that nice. hardware that's really store. That's yeah. Really, that's really so, yeah, good things. Oh, it's good so things. good. Uh, we, uh, that, seriously now, that's big news for uh, 
And, and we have a scoop right here on the inter- on viewpoint. See yeah, how about uh, that? You have a semi scoop. Yeah, I can't <laughs> tell you. I can't tell you the. You'll get more name. than two listeners now. Yeah, yeah. we'll probably have three serious. or four. It is. It is. It, it's good stuff. And then in the, uh, and you know over there in Vinegar Hill, they they yes. put that uh, they put that pr- uh, combine together. They that nice grocery store on mm-hmm. the corner there. And uh, that's a nice place. That ties in with the local food co-op, too, because they'll be able to process and and create some of the product that then can get sold out of the market on the hill. Good for Vinegar Hill. That's Uh just great. Uh Well, uh, to ward off our feeling too good about ourselves in our area, what is it going to do to our area to have lost two colleges? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> that that is just a tremendous blow not only the loss of all those students who would be coming to yes. town and helping pump money into the local economy but right. to the jobs that were provided all the folks across the county and outside of the county who would drive to those places and work it, it's just a very serious challenging problem i was thrilled to hear that open arms congregation is interested in purchasing a large chunk of lincoln christian university were you aware of that oh, no They're using their chapel I yes know that. Yeah. open arms is just doing great great work and bringing lots of people into their church every sunday 500 600 people oh that's okay. such wonderful yeah. news at so many levels yes it is and they ha- saw the opportunity they're not going to buy the entire campus but a large chunk of it and then lcu is going to use the remaining portion for its pared down operation so there's a future there at least yeah thank you I don't, God. yeah i don't know what will happen with Lincoln College. That's the one that is really Well, we're not going to worry. We're not. We're going to worry about it, but we're not going to worry with our airtime on that because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I know this and I know that about that, and they don't know a doggone thing. Oh right, and, right. Uh, only by calling in and say I know this to be a fact because they don't know. No, if, if towards that point, I'll make one one editorial comment. I regularly read the Atlantic Go magazine. For it. Yeah. I really enjoy the Atlantic. It's very. Uh, well-written and well-researched and neutral for the most part, in my opinion. It doesn't seem to have an agenda. Say again? It's difficult to find that today. And I just finished reading, and I'm going to go back and read it again, a wonderful article on how social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., has made the country much more stupid than it was exactly. 10 years ago. Amen. Exactly. Uh-huh. That, and that and word. I would recommend everybody read that article. Well, it's going to be fixed now because Twitter has been well. bought. And I <laughs> you know, I was glad let's to move, see let's this. Let's move on. I was glad yes. to see this Musk fellow buy Twitter. I don't know a thing. I'm not on Twitter. And I, I just don't. It's a, I'm not interested in it at all as a social media. So I have no skin in the game, so to speak. But just philosophically, I'm just glad to see him buy it. And push the leftists uh-huh. out of the way. Well, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. It'll be interesting. The only uh, tweets I'm interested all in are from the birds on I'm my patio. Allow. Well, <laughs> you know, you hear people say something off the cuff, and uh, I think, well, gee, that's kind of funny, you know. And if anybody questions them, they say, well, it was on Facebook, so. Uh-uh. Uh, no. read, read the article me. in the Atlantic magazine. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll so. get that. Oh. I can't go to Alvey's Drugstore and buy a copy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Yeah. Uh, Bill, let's yes. get on to serious business. About, uh, oh, hey, William and Judy, did anybody want to tell them who I am? Oh, didn't morning? we? No. Bill Thomas, I, Economic Development. Well, maybe you did. And see, my short-term memory is bad, too. Oh, so you probably you caught it from <laughs> yeah. me. I'm glad you had, had two in there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> that fits right in. My apologies, then. Yeah. Oh, so I, I first met Mr. Thomas no. when he was business busy in the school administration business. I had some grandchildren going to his grade school, and that's how I met Bill and later Chris Thomas. And now I have grandchildren going and to that grade school. Have, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, catch so, us up with uh, you. So that's been a, a, an acquaintance that I've enjoyed down through the years, and he brought an awfully nice wife. Well, it was a, Yes. She certainly went to the Presbyterian Church there as a secretary and <laughs> oh, for you know a all long about time. Chris. So yeah. um, we're happy to have you. Thank happy you. you. I, I was glad thrilled when Judy called. I really of, was. Uh, I'm glad that it is. Well, you were, you were awfully nice. You really are. 
Well, Don't I appreciate you get that. sick of being so sweet? Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. Tell me about serious business. Why are you here? <laughs> 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 Not quite sure, but Judy called and asked if I would step in, and I said, of course. I didn't even let her finish the sentence, Bill. I said, Judy, I'll be there. <laughs> oh, you you did, too. By right. golly, and I could have kissed you right on the well, cheek for that. Well, my wife was standing right next to me. So. Oh, well, yeah. mustn't do that then. Yeah, <laughs> but I did, and then I, I, I said yes so readily because whether you know it or not, you're doing me a favor because oh. I love this kind of opportunity. I love to tell stories. And I thought, oh, they haven't asked me to speak about anything in particular, so maybe I can decide what I'm going to talk about. And hey, go for it. I got up this morning at a uh, quarter after five. Oh, went to, Well, I was excited. Uh, went to work about six and just pulled several things from my files, and they deal with a theme, because you got to have things in order, in my opinion. They deal with a theme, and the theme is, usually I tell stories about what has happened in Atlanta and uh, its history and businesses and all that. But this time I have several stories, if you want to hear them. I do. About people and things that have either come to or passed through Atlanta. So they're very fleeting. I love to hear those kinds of things. And you know, I'm not the only one. Both of our listeners love Both that. Both of them. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're batting a, a thousand. So... <laughs> so. Uh, as they say in show business, take it from the top, sir. Well, I'm going to take it from even before Atlanta was founded in 1853. Really? The guy that founded the town was Richard Gill. He was from over in Pekin. Okay? And he was smart enough to realize when he heard that a railroad was going to be built from St. Louis to Chicago that, oh, the middle stopping point on that railroad line is going to be an important place because it's going to be a natural stopping point. Right. And that's why he bought the land where Atlanta sits now. He knew where the railroad was going to be. The story for that is Richard Gill was driving a stagecoach at the time from Peoria to oh. Springfield, and many of his travelers were state legislators. So he listened to them talk, and he heard before legislation was ever passed that they were going to build this railroad. So he had to jump on the gun. Typical oh. Illinois semi-corrupt, maybe. That's pretty remarkable. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Going so back we've been doing here. it for a long time, yeah, so it's not right. a surprise. Anyway, that's not the point of the story. Richard Gill had a younger brother, John. Younger brother John was very adventurous, and he went off and he fought in the Mexican War, 1846 oh. to 48. And he would, do you know this story, Jim? He was a member of the U.S. troops that took over the camp and almost captured Mexican General Santa Ana. Really? The guy that defeated us at the Alamo. This yeah. was before yeah. the Alamo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They surprised them. Everybody in the Mexican camp fled hurriedly, including Santa Ana, Santa Ana but he left something behind. He actually left three things behind in his tent. Boy, he left his leg, didn't he? He left his wooden leg. <laughs> he left a, a box full of gold and a roast chicken. <laughs> oh, okay? gosh. That's all documented. John Gill and another man from Pekin took possession of the leg. Okay? okay. They brought it back home with them. For a while, they let people come and see it for a dime. <laughs> oh, dear heaven. Is that no, right? Yes. Ten cents, you they put the it on display. And then they eventually turned it over and it ended up in the Illinois State Museum. And what I enjoy is, I, enjoy isn't the right word, what I just find intriguing is over the years there have been attempts by both the state of Texas and the country of Mexico to get that leg back. Okay. Okay. And there, if you want to see it. And it currently reposits in the state. It is down in the state museum. Oh my. Yes, it is there. And just to read Complete to you. Complete with a, a thigh high. Or oh, a, yes, a, a strap. A half high up. boot. Yep. And all. Oh, my goodness. So, according to the State Journal Register, over the years there have been many requests. The requests have gotten nowhere with the legs' faithful guardians. The answer is no. 
Lieutenant Colonel Brad Lighton, Public Affairs Director of the Illinois Department of Military Affairs, told the State Journal Register of Springfield, we paid for that leg with Illinois blood. His words bring to mind the response also of Texas forces in Gonzales when Mexican troops demanded the return of a cannon that American troops had captured from the Mexicans. The Texans hoisted a flag emblazoned with their answer, come and take it. <laughs> if Texas wants something from Illinois, we have some things we might be willing to spare, is what the state of Illinois told Texas when it asked for the leg. For example, we would give them an Arctic day in February, or a corrupt alderman from Chicago. Oh, <laughs> well, we have some and, of those. And, yes, and they were they were the plethora of them. Yes, oh, the, God. plenty to plenty to go around. Yeah. As were those days in February. Oh, now, I know some people around here who are named Gill. Would they be descendants? Oh, could very well be. Yes, and Jim, so you have a point of reference. You know where Norma Kindred lived on the west side of town. The only house in town that is outside on the outside of the boundary of the town where the streets are anyway yeah. that was richard gill's house oh, really? the founder of atlanta's house was that house lincoln stayed at that house because he and lincoln were friends lincoln was richard gill's lawyer okay well Which he can is honestly taking me to the say next story, but lincoln slept here then oh well, I can't prove that, <laughs> but I know I know Lincoln was in town all uh -huh. the time. Yeah. And we have lots of stories about that, but here's a story that not many people know. Have you ever heard of a person in town, this goes way back, Jim, called Dr. Angel? No. Uh, Dr. Angel's house still stands. Susan Hoblet owns it. It's over there on Broadway Street. It's that two-story red cedar-sided house, where the greenhouse used to be, okay. where Alice's greenhouse used right. to be. That was Dr. Angel's house. Dr. A-N-G-E-L-L. -L. Yes. Oh, two L's. Yes. Dr. Angel had an office downtown. And you've heard of the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates, I, right? I have heard of it. The most <laughs> famous one of which was up in Freeport, Illinois. Uh -huh. Well, when Dr. Angel was an older man, in the 1920s, he was reminiscing about his experiences in meeting Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln came to town all the time, but nobody talks a lot about this particular story. According to Dr. Angel, who had an office downtown, right next to where the grocery store was downtown. <clears throat> that building is gone, though, now. Lincoln was in town the day before the famous Freeport debate. He was headed on his way okay. and he had to stop because he needed to do some legal work for Richard Gill. Huh. Richard Gill and Angel were friends so Lincoln and Gill met in Dr. Angel's office in downtown um, Atlanta. After they can finish the legal business Lincoln said, hey, do you have a spare room where I could just go and do something for a while? And they said, sure, you can use the room upstairs in the back. So a little later, they could hear Lincoln shouting upstairs. And Senator Douglas, I believe, he oh. was upstairs practicing uh -huh. for the Freeport for the debate. debate. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just love that story. I just oh think that's a cool gosh. one. There's yeah. a direct connection to history that nobody ever knew about as far as I went. No. Speaking of direct connections, uh, this program operates because we have sponsors. And we better give them a direct connection or we're going to have dead air. Go right ahead, Mr. Ash. And we're live in the studios back here in Atlanta, Illinois, station WLCN 96.3 on your FM dial. The usual Wednesday morning program, Viewpoint, appearing each Wednesday at 0815 to 0900 hours, bringing you guests from all over the community. Twice. Well, that's a big town. Uh, deserves. Uh, it he's, deserves. He's it. trying to make them look bigger anyway, than they are. Our guest this morning, Mr. Bill Thomas, <laughs> fellow that I've gotten to know down through the years. Uh, if I tell him how many years, he's just going to put age on me, and I'm not going to tell you it was many, many years ago. But in any event, uh, that's been a, a, a joy for me to get to know the Me Thomas. too, Bill. He really? Me and, too. Uh, um, Bill is a historian besides a promoter for... Uh, uh, all things fine here in Atlanta, and we're we're delving into the, some of the history of Atlanta. And he just finished telling us a story about a guy who had the smarts to uh, buy a ground here where Atlanta now sits, 
because of something you overheard as he was a stagecoach driver. And I find that very, very yep. interesting. Yeah. Yep, it was great. This next one is a little bit more depressing, but I just it's a fascinating coincidence of somebody that just came to Atlanta, I bet, for only one day and then left, but later was involved in a pretty historic event. In September of 1875, there was a considerable uh, African-American black uh, community in Atlanta. A lot of blacks returned to Atlanta with Atlanta Union soldiers oh. after the war. Oh. Atlanta was a hotbed no of abolitionism. Yeah, and Atlanta was a hotbed of abolitionism and uh -huh. very pro or anti-slavery. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> these guys know that, so they yes. kind of gravitated here. Yes. Sure. So anyway, as uh, in order to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, the 11th anniversary, the black community in Atlanta decided to hold this huge, grand, old-style barbecue on the grounds of the fairgrounds south of town, down by where the cemetery is. So they invited all sorts of dignitaries. There were over 600 African Americans in attendance, and according to the newspapers, almost if not more that many whites who just stood around the perimeter and watched. And watched. Okay, yeah. I love that <laughs> aspect of the story. But they brought up a band to be the featured band from Springfield, and it was Rogers All Black Cornet Band. They were Ooh. evidently very well known, and a cornet player in the band, one of them, was named William K.H. Donegan. There'd be no reason for any of us to know that name or pay any no, attention no. to that name, except a couple decades later, and I believe it was 19... Six or eight, whenever the terrible race riots were in Springfield, mm -hmm. Illinois, mm -hmm. that resulted in the formation of the NAACP. Really? William Donegan was the person who the white mob, he had done nothing. He had done nothing, but he was a prominent citizen, uh -huh. and people were a little bit jealous of his success. Sure. Mm -hmm. He had done nothing. The white mob broke into his home and lynched him. Oof, mm -hmm. He was the lynching that happened in the Springfield race riots that then resulted in formation of the NAACP. And, the and he was on our, in our fairgrounds yeah. at the Grand Old Style Barbecue to celebrate How the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that something? Which for you Lincolnites who enjoy the Gogan County Fair, uh, we weren't the first on the market. Uh, we had uh, Go uh, Gogan County Fair was right up here in the south of Atlanta. Many, many years back. And it was actually a, a three-county fair at the time. It oh. was DeWitt, Logan, and Tazewell counties. And Atlanta was chosen because it was sort of in the middle, and the railroad lines sure. Oh, sure. came to Atlanta. Oh, so much deep. It was actually, it railroad. wasn't called the Logan County Fair at that time, Bill. It was started in 1860. It was the Atlanta Union Agricultural Society Fair. And it was union because it was the union of these three counties. Sure. Yeah, it went to 1928. Um, and contrary to what, I'm sorry, fellow Atlantans, contrary to what some Atlantans say, Lincoln did not steal that fare from us. That fare just, just came into some financial straits. It, it wasn't closed. supported yeah. as well as it was, and they had to close the Yeah, doors. it wasn't until 35 or 37. Uh, I think it was 37 that Logan County... Okay, I it. couldn't have told you that, yeah. because, yeah, that's a number of years after it closed here well, in 1928. Well, that's where I made some of my first money. Okay. <laughs> I, sold, I sold programs. Wilbur Lehman is in charge of uh, that part of the Logan County Fair, and he got a bunch <laughs> of us high school shows, and we'd sell programs. Huh. We got two cents a program. I remember that. And the first day I would sell these programs for the uh, uh, horse show of that evening, and they asked if I had a pen or something to write on their pro. Well, the next uh, next day I went to Kresge's Dime Store, <laughs> and I bought a bunch of pens, and then marked them up about three times. And then sold <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I became a first-hand entrepreneur. <laughs> yes. See, the, yeah, go ahead. Give, give us the list. You were talking off the air about what Atlanta was called at, at this oh. time and that time and the other time. Settlers first 
tried to found the town and establish it in 1853, and they wanted to name it Xenia, X-E-N-I-A, after Xenia, Ohio. Oh. And they wanted to name it because they were they had come out from Xenia, Ohio, and like happened in so many New Philadelphia, New Brun, New York, all that. That was what they did. But when they applied for permission to name it Xenia, there was already a registered Xenia post office in the state, so they could not use that name. The next name they tried was Hamilton. We do not know why, or at least I've never found why they chose that name, but there was also a Hamilton post office already in the state at the time. In 1858, the town's founder, Richard Gill, had just returned from a trip down to Atlanta, Georgia, and he decided, okay, let's try Atlanta. So they applied for permission, and that was granted. And it flew, didn't it? Yep. Yeah, when I used to deal with all the tourists in town and the buses, they'd uh, want to know about the name, and I'd always tell them, "Yeah, uh, it was named after." I, I think there's another. I think there's another one down south in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Maybe. Thomas, uh, <laughs> was it your profession that piqued your interest in history? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Bill. Is that, was that your Cuba Elementary School? Yeah, where I attended, mm -hmm. 1965. First day of school, Mrs. Huddleston is handing out the textbooks. This is just emblazoned in my memory, Bill. And she puts down the social studies textbook on my desk. And there on the front, in vibrant four colors, is a picture of the Spanish conquistador explorer, Hernando de Soto. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought, and he had that helmet on, that yeah. metal pointy helmet, and a breastplate. And I thought, that is the coolest thing ever. And that hooked me on history. That's what I majored in. That's what I taught. And that's what I can't give up. Well, and you sure have a mind for the uh, dates and f facts. Well, and most of it's written down, points. Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, but most of it's written down. But this next one, oh my God, I, I love. Think you're a miracle. Well, let's move. Let's move to the next point. On I you. love this next one. Yeah. You all know who. You're all going to know this name when I say this name. But I bet you didn't know that he actually went through Atlanta and stopped. Scott Joplin, the, oh. the, yeah. the founder of Ragtime, Rag the yeah. creator of Ragtime. Mm -hmm. This is just an amazing story. Do you know <laughs> Murphy Hall in town? Murphy Hall was our opera house. It sits where Casey's is, okay. or the oh. old where the city hall is. Right. Okay? okay, it sat right there. It was our big opera house. It was the meeting place. They regularly booked acts to come and stop there. Now, what period of time are oh, we Oh, this is 1903. Okay. Murphy Hall was built in, I think, 1878, and it was still around in the 40s and early 50s, and then they finally tore it down. Everything imaginable happened at Murphy Hall. School graduations before they built the gym that you would have known, uh, parties, all, all sorts of things. Anyway, 1903, September 9th. Scott Joplin has written the world's first ragtime opera. Nobody I had ever done it before. Never knew and he that. And he calls it an honored guest. And what it did, it told the story of Booker T. Washington's visit to the White House when Theodore Roosevelt was president, which was a very controversial yeah, huh, event. At the time, okay? Mm -hmm. So Joplin wrote an opera, a ragtime opera about it, and he decided to take it on tour. The, he tried it out in East St. Louis, and then the first stop on the tour was Springfield, Illinois, okay? Two days before he was scheduled to bring the tour and the opera to, of all places, Atlanta, Illinois. Illinois. The town newspaper, the Atlanta Argus, mm -hmm. of course, wrote an article about this touring company. And here's what they had to say. Mm -hmm. This is from Wednesday, September 9th, 1903. Oof, Scott Joplin's Ragtime Opera Company presented a guest of honor at Murphy Hall Wednesday night to a small audience. The company is composed entirely of colored people, and the opera is the work of one of their members. They are a well-dressed and well-behaved lot of colored people, evidently without much stage experience. The choruses were sung with much spirit, and there are several good voices in the company. There were some pleasing special songs, but taken in a whole, 
the performance was very amateurish. <laughs> oh, dear <laughs> so the review wasn't all that good. <laughs> but the rest of the story, as our dear departed friend Paul Harvey always said, the rest yes. of the story is while they were in Springfield, the manager of the opera company stole all of the costumes and the box receipts and left them and left penniless. Them high and dry. The tour, to our knowledge, never continued past Atlanta, Illinois. Is that right? So Atlanta, Illinois could claim fame to being the second and last performance because the music was lost. The music to the that opera was stolen, was stolen well. and lost. To this day, we don't know what it we know what it was about, but we don't know what it sounded like. Oh and my. here we are in 2022, and I still enjoy Scott Joplin. Oh music. my gosh, yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Another oh. another Murphy Hall story. Do you know who I'm talking about, Bill? If I talk about Colonel A. H. Bogardus, yeah, yes. Captain Bogardus. He was a wing sh uh, champion skeet shooter. Yes, yeah. it. absolute they it champion skeet, skeet trap shooter. Yes, yeah, trap shooter. Yeah, he came up came from to Elkhart. <clears throat> yes, he lived in Elkhart. He visited Atlanta, Atlanta's Murphy and Hall. Murphy this is Murphy Hall. Hall. I'm showing a picture, all you radio viewers. Just take a close look. I'm showing you a picture. Both of you, both of you, <laughs> both both of you put your dials. glasses on, yes, and take a look. He came up because, I just find this amazing. It was a pretty big building, Yeah. but what did he do? He came and he told about his adventures on the trap shooting, skeet shooting circuit. Yeah. But before they had the clay pigeons that people shot, do you know what they shot originally? Birds. Birds. birds that's right. They started out with live birds. Yeah. And then they went to something else what? before clay pigeons. What? 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 Glass, Glass balls. balls. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, so, how come it morphed into that? I have no idea. I don't know if there was they a ran out of birds. That, yeah, I don't know if <laughs> people complained about them shooting live birds. Maybe. maybe. So. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But his show... The night he came to Murphy Hall was he developed a special spring device mm -hmm. and inside Murphy Hall, inside, they would release the glass ball and he would shoot. shoot. <laughs> I, oh. I, I, just, I would have given anything to be there. He later appeared that. on well, uh, Buffalo Bill's. Yes, circuit. he rode with Buffalo Bill. Yeah. Yes, yeah. he did. That's He's right. He's from down south, southern Logan County, Elkhart. Yep. Is that, yeah, that's right. I didn't yeah. know that. Uh, one of my other favorite Murphy Hall stories is in um, 1932, they held a big political rally at Murphy Hall. It was a site of lots of political rallies. <clears throat> and somebody rode to the hall that night on their donkey, okay, and left it tied up to the door, the front door. And here's what the, because something happened, here's what the Argus reported. Okay. So this is the story of the donkey that came to Atlanta but never left. Oh. Okay. It's titled, Atlanta's Democratic Donkey Gains Wide Publicity. <laughs> Brief mention was made last week concerning the Halloween prank of certain Atlanta young people in tying one of Ed Graham's mules to the door of Murphy Hall while the Republican rally was in progress. The Associated Press sent out the story on the incident when it was reported that the animal had subsequently died. The Democratic donkey, which attended a Republican rally Halloween night, died today, and its death became a local political controversy. <laughs> Declared the Democrats, his death was caused by colic gassing resulting from a severe oratorical gassing by the Republican speakers. <laughs> oh, gosh! <laughs> Said the Republicans in reply, no. The poor jackass heard the truth about his party and evidently died from fright. <laughs> oh, if only we wrote in newspapers yeah, that way, way the, today. The I think, oh I think we'd all be better off. But the I love that day was was remarkable. I love to read. I got. I was helping out at the Atlanta G, or the Lincoln Genealogical Society, uh -huh. and one of my assignments was to file obituaries. Oh, the way they do that. Yep. And I got so engrossed on reading the obituaries, I got relieved from my duty because I didn't get the job yep, done. Yep, no, I believe it. <laughs> so the pose of the it. day was really something. Six four eight five five one zero. Last time to get a chance to talk to Bill <laughs> Thomas, we've been so engrossed. Six four eight five five one zero. Somebody may have been here at the Atlanta Fair. 
1908. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, well, one, one last story. Oh, I've got more, but we're, right we're running out of time. Right but ahead, th- yeah. I love this one because it doesn't have anything to do with somebody taking the train into Atlanta or driving Route 66 through Atlanta or riding their horse to Atlanta. This involves flying over Atlanta. Okay. And I'm not sure many people are aware of this, but Charles A. Lindbergh yeah. has a connection to the skies above Atlanta. He would fly on mail planes. Yes. Not only did he do the first transatlantic solo flight yeah. that made him so famous, but his job was he flew the mail from St. Louis up to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Okay. Up and back. Mm-hmm. And in those days, before radar and radio, how did they know where they were going? It's the railroad tracks. They followed the railroad tracks, <laughs> and then they followed Route 66. Yeah. Oh, sure. And in Atlanta, anyway, as reported, Central Illinois felt a special connection and familiarity with Lindbergh because he had flown the airmail route between St. Louis and Chicago, which passed over Atlanta. In May of 1930, to aid flyers between Chicago and St. Louis and those crossing the states, Atlanta's name was painted on the roof of the Standard Oil bulk plant building at the north end of town. In June 1930, D.J. Weber also painted a sign on his lumberyard roof. That lumberyard was just in the south lot uh, behind the library, mm-hmm. Jim. Mm-hmm. Okay, right between R- Route 66 and the railroad. Mm-hmm. So Lindbergh could know where he was in the middle of the state because Atlanta painted its name on two of its buildings. Isn't that something? Yeah. You <laughs> have been such fun today. We're going to have you back soon as we can get you and uh i have enjoyed this immensely oh, and i'm sure both of our listeners have well we thank them both bless for listening. your heart yeah. Six forty five five one. you missed your chance to talk to billy thomas uh bill we appreciate very much your taking your time i know chris kind of checks you out of the house and make sure you get back by nine thirty. so we'll, we'll let you go for now but we appreciate the fact of sharing uh, a lot of the history of Atlanta, uh, Jim's old hometown. And so, uh, till the next time we bring you back, we thank you for Viewpoint. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very much, Bill Thompson. Thank you.